Hi, my name is Mohamed. I'm going to tell you about our paper, Fault Tolerant Control of Robot Manipulators with Sensory Faults Using Unbiased Active Inference. Well, it's a mouthful, but we're going to break it down. But first, thanks to my authors, Corrado, Ricardo, Carlos, and Nick. We're with the Oxford Robotics Institute at the, at the University of Oxford and the TU Delft. An overview of the paper. First, we start with a problem statement. And it's simply, we want to control our system, given that one of the sensors could have a fault in it. For instance, a sensor might freeze. One way to do fault tolerant control is using the so-called active inference controller. And although this controller has some remarkable properties, it has a lot of limitations when we use it for fault tolerant control, which we're going to discuss in detail. Unbiased active inference is our way, our novel contribution to overcome all the, all the mentioned limitations. And we're going to explain it clearly. And we're going to show how it relates to different control architectures and we, how to use it for fault order control. Finally, we will have some results and conclusions and then some suggestions for future work. The problem statement. We have a robotic arm, which has some state, which compromises of the joint positions and velocities. So for this two-dimensional robot arm, the state would have four entries. We have some starting configuration x0. I want to arrive at some goal, x goal. The system is equipped with multiple sensors, including joint encoders and velocity encoders for every joint. And it has a camera that retrieves the Cartesian coordinates of the end effector. So given these three coordinates, one of them would have a fault in it. For instance, one of these sensors will freeze, and we still want to be able to control our system from the starting configuration to the goal, despite the occurrence of that fault. Model-based fault tolerant techniques are often used to solve such problems. These have two distinct steps. The first is fault detection, which typically involves some supervision block to model a so-called residual signal against a threshold. So a threshold is like a boundary, Think of it as a safety boundary, and that can be defined either by an expert or data, learned from data. And then a residual is something to monitor, and if that residual exceeds the threshold, then a fault is detected. Once it's detected and isolated, a recovery mechanism is needed, which, broadly speaking, is some form of controller redesign, either by changing some parameters or switching to a different controller entirely. Now up to the active inference controller. It's a probabilistic model that has two random variables, or multiple random variables, including these two. X of t is my current state, which is hidden, so I call it blue. Y of t is my current observation, which is orange, because it's a known random variable. These are connected by probability distributions, given by these black blocks right here. And this is a general architecture. For instance, this could be a Coleman filter, where this prior p of x t is some kind of prediction step. And this is a measurement model and solving x p of x t given y t, computing the distribution, is estimating our state. So what is the difference in this active inference controller? Well, it's exactly like one of these Bayesian filters, like a Coleman filter, but this prior is biased towards the target. So we predict that we move closer to the target every time step, regardless of what's actually happening in the world. And minimizing that prediction error will make this come true. So we want to compute p of x given y, but that's often expensive. So we approximate it with a variational distribution q of x, which we assume to be Gaussian. So we want to find the Gaussian distribution that's closer to the true distribution. And a difference or the mismatch is given by the so-called kl divergence, which is this term right here. So to minimize this kl divergence, we end up minimizing something called the variation of free energy, which using certain assumptions turns out to be a quadratic formula and some logarithm terms. So to achieve anything in this model, we minimize free energy with respect to the appropriate variables. So to achieve state estimation, we minimize the free energy with respect to the beliefs. So mu of x is our belief over this variable x right here. To achieve control, we minimize free energy with respect to the control variable. But there is no control variable in this model. And so we end up using the chain rule with the observations. So the properties of active inference controller are interesting because we have one cost function and we use that single cost function to obtain whatever we want, like state estimation and control. And we can even learn some of these covariances, like these sigmas over here. So from a control perspective, the diagram would look as following. We would have a dynamical system, the robot. It outputs some state. That state would be observed and given some noise 
in some measurement model. There will be some noise on the sensor, for, in for instance, the encoders. The observation will go into the controller and into the state estimator. And this is quite strange because the observations will go into state estimation and also get a goal. Like typically a filter does not need any type of goal. And then the belief mu of x, which we want to be as accurate as possible to x, as close as possible, because it's our belief about the true state, that one is biased. It's biased towards this goal. And then the measurement and the bias go into the controller and we end up with a control action. So this is quite a strange scheme. A traditional control and filtering scheme would look, would look more like this. We have a dynamical system. We output a state. That state will be observed using some model and some noise. We would get a measurement, y. Our filter, or our state estimation module, would typically take in a measurement and would output a belief that is close to x, that is not biased in any way. And then the controller would have a goal and would have a belief of where we are now and would give us a control action to get there. So this is more intuitive, this, this makes sense. But this architecture right here is quite strange. However, this architecture happens to be, happens to have a lot of benefits. But before we go into the benefits, let's talk about how to do fault detection with it. We have all these error terms right here, which are these quadratic, from this quadratic equation. And some of these error terms are the so-called sensory prediction errors. For, for instance, we'd have one for the joint encoder, the difference between the belief of where the state is and so mu of x in this case, or mu because there's only one mu, uh, and yq, which is the measurement from the joint encoder, and the same for the velocity and visual encoders. And then we would use these as residuals against any threshold we have designed beforehand. And if a threshold is exceeded, we go to the appropriate precisions or the inverse covariance and set them to zero. So if the threshold for the joint encoder is, is exceeded, then we go to the precision of that encoder and we put it zero. And thus it will not be used in any optimization with free energy. So that's how we do fault detection and recovery, broadly speaking. For more details, you can see the, the related work in the paper. But there's a big problem in this active inference controller. If we change the target over time, that will change the way our state is biased, our state estimate is biased. And that will result in the prediction errors, which we use as residuals being increasing, even though there's no fault. So I'm simply tracking this green trajectory right here. And my belief and the true position are accurate or the, 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 the bias is very small. You can't even see it in the plot. So it helps us achieve control and state estimation. But once we switch to a different set point, the sensor prediction errors increases. So for any pick and place application, every time you need to switch to different set points, your system will be like, well, all the sensors are broken, even though it's not the case. And obviously this is a huge limitation. So, and that's again, because of this biased state estimate, like this top left corner, this mu of X that I marked in red. So the benefits of the active inference controller are, we have a single cost function for state estimation and control. And we can, and that can allow us to deal with missing sensory data easily and also large unmodeled dynamics as, as previous work has shown. And the prediction errors can also be directly used as residuals. So we don't need additional, additional supervision on the system. And the recovery action is fairly simple as well. So this simplifies the whole fault or control process. However, it has also key limitations. The state is biased towards the target, often a lot. The control action is not explicitly modeled. And most importantly, there are a lot of false positive whenever the set point changes. So how do we overcome these? Well, with the unbiased active inference controller. This is the previous controller we had. And now we simply add a control variable. And we define this distribution, p of u given x. And we put the bias here. We encode the bias towards the target in this block rather than the prior, like we did before. So this simple change allows us to retain all the benefits, but overcome the limitations we mentioned. So now, the, this simple change also corresponds to one of the traditional control schemes, where we don't have this biased state estimate anymore, but the flow of information happens naturally, like similar to the traditional schemes, unlike the active inference controller. So in the active inference controller, we had a model and then we had the KL divergence and then a quadratic free energy and then we minimized it. Now we have basically the same thing with the unbiased active inference controller, just have a slightly different model. 
and we, we still have the KL divergence quadratic equation and state estimation is still the same but now control action can be directly minimized because we knew we now have a control action in the model we don't have to use a chain rule anymore and also mu of u rather than just u why is that because previously u the control action was just a variable but now it's a random variable so we compute a distribution over it. And the mean of the distribution, of the Gaussian distribution, is mu of u. So the benefits of the unbiased active inference controller is we still retain a single cost function to achieve both estimation and control. So that gives us a lot of the benefit we mentioned earlier. This, but now the state is not biased towards the target and the actions are explicitly modeled. And this can be used both in conjunction with fault order control techniques or as a standalone. And finally, slightly tangential to this paper, extra priors can be added if we have domain knowledge. For instance, if we have a feedforward control signal, we can add it as a prior over the control action, and that would increase the performance as well. So fault order control techniques, any technique can be used in conjunction with the unbiased active inference. We use a technique that relies on probabilistically robust thresholds. The deals are in the paper. Nothing, no novel contributions here. The only, the only thing to be noted is we would need to separate proprioceptive and visual sensory data in a separate free energy terms for the threshold, for the residual and threshold detection. The results, fairly simple experiment. We have a robot arm that needs to track some trajectory that moves over time. And if now there is a set point change and a fault occurs, the belief is that we are at the target, but we are usually not when a fault occurs, and with a recovery action, the fault does occur. So we use the unbiased active inference controller with a state-of-the-art fault detection method, and they work together just fine. We also have a table with more results, and here we can see something critical, which is since our encoders are more accurate, when the encoder fault occurs, the error is much bigger than when the camera fault occurs. But with this scheme, we can deal with easily encoder faults with a position or velocity or camera faults in the exact same fashion, unlike previous work, which could only deal with encoder faults and not camera faults. So for future work, there's something interesting to consider, which is we use these error terms as residuals, and then once a fault is detected and isolated, we set its appropriate precision or the inverse covariance to be zero. But what if we learn these precisions? So not zero or one, we don't have this sigma to be zero or some value. It's essentially proportional to how faulty the sensor is. So now we get stochastic fault order control. And what if we don't do this, we don't make this assumption and get a quadratic equation, but we do full Bayesian inference? Well, we get something like this. I have a system here, a fault is injected at the gray line, and then a camera, given by these red dots, the camera measurements, are now biased. They have an offset. So the green system is around the true trajectory, which is this dashed black line, but the red line is now has a jump. Well, what we get is if no fault occurs, our belief will be somewhere in the middle, depending on how much we trust each of these sensors. Now, if we just learn these covariances in a Bayesian fashion, the uncertainty overall is higher. However, we can easily deal with, with the fault occurring without any fault detection beforehand, without using any techniques, we the only thing we do is just, we just learn these precisions or inverse covariances online in a Bayesian fashion. So to conclude, we propose to solve fault order control problems as probabilistic inference. We discuss previous work which talked about the active inference controller, and we discuss its limitations for fault order control in detail. Then to overcome all these limitations, we make a small change which results in the unbiased active reference controller which can be easily used in conjunction with any existing technique. The results were promising compared to state-of-the-art methods. We could even deal with camera faults with no problems. And by learning these covariances, we open an avenue for a different type of fault tolerant techniques that, that can be both used for, stoch for stochastic fault tolerance or deterministic fault tolerance. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. My name is Mohammed again, and if you have any email and if you have any questions, email me at mohammed at robots.ox.ac.uk. And see you at the conference.